Again, good morning to you all. One announcement that I forgot to uh, announce was uh, last week we, we honored our veterans. And again, thank you veterans for your service to our country. And we gave each of you a, a gift bag. And uh, we had some left over. And I meant to uh, make this announcement as well. But if you have a family member, maybe there's someone within your, your home, your immediate family, that could use a blessing, especially at this time they're a veteran, uh, please take the remainders. Or maybe you didn't stand up. Maybe you didn't get a bag. Bag, uh, please grab one on your way out. On your way out, this door to my left, to your right, uh, they're on the table just near the coat, uh, the coat rack. So please grab a bag on your way out uh, if you have not received one. And then if there's any left over, please feel free to take them uh, for a friend, a loved one, uh, that just a way for us to be a blessing to them and just to, to honor our veterans. Again, thank you. Thank you again for your service. If you will, uh, please turn with me to the book of Nahum, the Nahum, however you want to say it. Nahum is, seems to be a little bit more uh, correct, but could be Nahum if you want to hum. Either way. There may be some, a lot of that humming the closer I get to lunchtime. Hmm, are you going to finish up? Well, we shall see. We have three chapters to get through. Uh, but Nahum, what is this book all about? Why, again, study the minor prophets? What truth can we find in these books that could directly impact me? Well, perhaps you saw a pattern as we were singing. And uh, most time, either it's on Wednesdays or Thursdays, that Daniel or Kristen will text me and say, hey, what's the message points about? And what are some songs that we could think about f for doing? And this message is all about God's justice, but it's also about God's love. And remember that we will never know the depths of God's love if we did not know of God's wrath. We would never understand truly what we've been saved from if we didn't know the sins that we were committing. We would never know of the punishment that we'd receive if it were not for God's wrath. Because we have God's wrath and because we have God's love, we have this supernatural balance. We say, well, how does that work? Well, God is just. God is merciful. God is wrathful. He is all that. And in that characteristic of God, it is perfectly balanced. You and I don't possess that. It's supernatural. It can only be God that can do that. Oftentimes we try to be righteous, but sometimes we fall and know that God is always righteous. God will always do what is right. And we find that here in the book of Nahum. We think of what's the big idea of this book. We think, if you will, look to the, the back of your handout as we uh, discuss just the overall viewpoint of, of Nahum. But in his infinite mercy, God is infinite in his mercy. And again, the, the idea of something that never started and never ends just blows our mind. I don't know about you, but it blows my mind because we're so, we're so stuck on a timeline. We think, well, right now my day begins at this time and it will end at this time. My week started now and it will end on Saturday. Or this has been a constant, continuous year and I don't think the year's ever going to end. Maybe that's your thought. But the idea of infinite, that God is eternal, sometimes doesn't make sense to us. And we even find in the pages of Nahum, he describing that about God. But in his infinite mercy, God always reveals himself and his ways before he demonstrates his power. He told Jonah, Jonah, go to the Ninevites. Go to them and warn them of my incoming judgment. Warn them of if they do not repent, punishment will come. And you remember Jonah's eight-word message, right? Uh, basically, to repent because in three days, God's going to destroy Nineveh. And they heard that and they repented. But we come a hundred plus years later and we find the book of Nahum where he is writing against 
Nineveh. This wasn't directly written to Nineveh and for Nineveh. Yes, there was a ministry about them, but ultimately it was to Judah. Because remember that Nineveh was the capital for Assyria. And Assyria, they were ruthless to the people of Judah. I mean, they would do horrible, horrible atrocities. And they would take them into captivity. And, and you remember going back a few other minor prophets in Esau and Edom, how they just let that all take place. And God had a lot of things to judge against Edom as well for that. So we have all these different characters and we're trying to wrap our mind around it. But for this particular message, just understand the point that God's justice will prevail. Because yes, the Assyrians, they were taking Israelites into captivity and the, and the people of Judah into captivity. And, and God uh, did not like what they were doing. And they continued to do so. They continued to sin. And God said to repent, repent. And they did at that one particular time with Jonah but then they fell right back. And so we often think of, well, what's the end of the story for Jonah? Did Jonah continue to make his ministry in Nineveh? It's unclear if that's what he did or if he came back into, into the land of Judah. But it seems that they no longer cared for the things of God. And you fast forward a few years, a few generations, a hundred years, that's you know two, three, four generations, depending on when they had children. And so we think, well, they didn't pass it on to their children. They didn't pass it on to their grandchildren. They didn't pass it on to their great-grandchildren of this wonderful message. It was a short message that Jonah delivered, but a message of mercy and of peace and of just simple repentance. And we understand what happens if we do not teach our children of the things of God. It doesn't take long for the next generation to say, well, I'll just, I'll just lean this way. And uh, I heard a quote once that says, where you lean, others will fall. If you, as a parent, are leaning this way towards just a little bit of air, it's not much, but then what happens with the next generation? Well, they lean a little bit further. What happens to the generation after that? They lean a little further, and next thing you know, they fall. So where you lean, others may fall. So what we can learn from the book of Nahum is that God, he reveals himself, and he did that with Nineveh. They repented. God said, here's my mercy. I'm giving it to you. I'm not going to destroy you. You've, you've been terrible to my people, but I'm going to forgive you. And he did that. Again, fast forward 100 more years, and we find God's judgment now coming to Nineveh. We find that no longer will they even be recognized. We find in, in the latter parts of, of chapter 1 and even to chapter 2 of how that the Lord will restore Jacob and will plunder and will ruin the cities of Nineveh, the city of Nineveh. And so we find that God's justice prevails. And so we think, well, how does Nahum fit into God's story? It once responded, the city of Nineveh once responded to the preaching of Jonah. They turned from their evil ways. Secondly, they repented. They, they said, that's not the route that we want to go. And they turned from their sin for a season. But children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren begin to live as bad or even worse than their forefathers. Nahum's prophecy was to not despair because ju God's judgments and justice will prevail. So the lesson that God is telling his people, saying, listen, my judgment will come to them. Don't you worry. My judgment will happen. Yes, my mercy and grace and love was upon them. They repented, but they turned again. And now they're, they're ruining God's people. They're chastising God's people. They're enslaving God's people. And God says, justice is coming. Uh, judgment will come to the people of Nineveh. So now we think, well, how can I apply this to me? Uh, I'm not a Ninevite. I'm not a, a, an Israelite. Uh, how can I fit God's story into my story? Well, number one, God is patient and slow to anger. It seems that God is a, a vengeful and wrathful God, but time and time again, Scripture says that he is slow to anger. The first or the third verse of chapter one, the Lord is slow to anger but that doesn't limit his power. He is supernaturally reserving his judgment. He's giving time for repentance. 
And so for us, when we mess up, and we mess up bad sometimes, sometimes we, we just completely forget God. And then we realize, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. The Lord is slow to anger. He's giving us an opportunity for repentance. As it says, secondly, he gives every country, you could even say every person, time to repent of sin and follow him as Lord. Revelation 2, verse 21 Speaking to the church here in the second chapter, I give, gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Speaking of the church there in Revelation, and, and what we're to do is say, I've messed up, God. I've sinned against you. And I repent of my sin. I turn to you. I plead for forgiveness. And it takes over and over and over for us to do that. Wouldn't it be so nice if we just prayed once and we'd be rid of all sin? God, this is going on. I, I, really, have a, I really have a problem with just being vengeful in my driving. And God, I want you to take it away. Does that happen? No, because then God continues to test us. And oh boy, here it comes again. And whatever it might be, list whatever you want there. Don't you wish that it'd be so easy for us to just pray one time and, and God take that away? Again, God continues to build us and to continue to grow us. And if we're living out 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we're giving God the glory, glory in our driving, glory in our eating, glory in our athleticism, glory in our work, glory in our study. We're giving all of our glory and praise to him because he is worthy. God is patient. He gives us time to repent. But also note, Galatians 6 says, God will not be mocked. God will not be mocked. God will not be ridiculed. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit Spirit's will from the Spirit reap eternal life. We're right now towards the tail end of harvest season. At least I hope that we're, we're, we're running to the end of harvest. Some of you say, I wish it was the end already. But either, either way, you're harvesting because of your hard work in the springtime. If you didn't put all that work in the spring, if you didn't till the ground, if you didn't plant the seed, if you didn't fertilize the ground, there wouldn't be any harvest or hardly any harvest. And so when it comes to us, when we are sowing these seeds of discord, we're sowing these seeds of doubt, we're sowing these seeds of sin, in the end, they will produce. And God says, I will not be mocked. God's judgment will come. God's correction will come. And when it does, we say, God, thank you. As hard as it is, even with when uh, discipline with a child growing up, you understand when uh, you weren't supposed to do something and you were disciplined, understand that your parents may have been very loving. No, you can't run outside by yourself with hardly any clothes on, little two-year-old Cody, and get into the van, as he did this past week, and running away from everyone. He's only two, and he's already running out of the house. Anyway, pray for us. Pray for my, my poor wife. No, you can't do that. You just can't run through Fulton by yourself. You're two. Understand that when discipline comes, it's for our good. It's for our benefit. It's driving us to that timeline of instruction. And that's what we're reminded of here in this book of Nahum. When, again, Jonah preached this repentance on the streets of Nineveh, the people responded, and they were joyful in that. But then again, a hundred plus years later, they fell back. And it's to remind us that we need to continue staying on top of our sin. We need to say, before the sun goes down, I need to say, God, I've messed up. I've sinned today. Help me and forgive me. You wake up the next morning and, and guess what? Your sins are forgiven. God forgave your sins last night when you asked him to. And you wake up in the morning and, and the psalmist says that his mercies are new. God gave you another day, another opportunity to give him glory. We are reminded that Nahum is the complement to Jonah. Jonah, he celebrated God's mercy. We can see that celebration. Maybe not necessarily Jonah did, but we can celebrate God's mercy. But Nahum marked the relentless march of God's judgment against sinners. So now we come to the text itself. 
What can we learn from this book? Well, a couple of questions that I have, and the first is being this, who is God? We really see who God is here in this text. We understand that when we read through, we see a side of God that we often cloud. We often we see a side of God that still remains true in 2023, and that is these verses. Number one, that the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. We say, well, I was always taught that being jealous was bad. Well, here, God is just. God is just in his jealousy. He used uh, Hosea. You remember when we studied Hosea? Hosea went and got a, a woman out of prostitution, and, and, and God is saying that this is like the picture that, you, that I have with my people Israel, that you keep going after other men. You keep, uh, you keep defiling yourself with other gods, and God says, I am your God. Every time you defile yourself and go to another kingdom and try to get that God to help you, it hurts me. And you and I, we still do the same thing today. We sometimes go after other helps instead of God. We sometimes go after and pursue other idols so that we can try to make ourselves feel better over our sin, but that's not God. God is a jealous God, an avenging God. He is avenging and he is wrathful. He takes vengeance on his adversaries. And we see that about God. A few truths about God is, number one, that God is alive. God is alive. The God that you serve, the God that you pray to, God the Father, he is alive. Jeremiah 10 reminds us of that. But the Lord is a true God. He is the living God and the everlasting king. His wrath, at his wrath, the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure his indignation. We see again this side of God. We, we often talk about God's love. For God so loved the world. Yes, I'm not minimizing that, but I'm trying to bring a balance for us to see that God is, yes, wrathful, but because of his wrath, we see the depths of his love. We see that he is both, and he is perfect in this. God is alive. Secondly, Nahum reminds us that God is eternal. God is eternal. The Lord is slow and anger and great in power, says the third verse. His way is in the whirlwind and storm. He rebukes the sea. On and on talks about how God did things before. God will continue to do things in the future. Remember when Jesus, he rebukes the sea. Well, God did that in the Old Testament and Jesus does that in the New Testament. He is eternal. The same power that God had in the Old Testament is also the same power that God has even today. He is not lacking in power. He is eternal. Isaiah 57, for thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. His name is holy. God, he is self-existent. This is another truth that we just sometimes have a hard time wrapping our brain around. But John 5, 26, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. He is self-existent. We know that he is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Isaiah, Isaiah 57, for thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. John 6, 57 also says, as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. Again, speaking about that God the Father and God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, are all three in one. They are self-existent. They are all three in one. And then lastly about God, we find in the books in the pages of Nahum is that God is to be worshipped. God is to be worshipped. And we worship God more than just up here singing hymns. We, we worship him more than just in our time of worship and prayer. We worship him more than just in our time of communion with one another, breaking of bread. We worship him every day or we should. Daniel 6, verse 26, I make a decree, this is the king, that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. This is a pagan king saying this about God. 
And if a pagan king can say this about God, what is the worship from our lips? What ought it to be? Is it, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not communicating with God right now. I don't want any part of God. I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to speak with him. I don't want to read his word. God is just not fun right now. God is to be worshiped, as it says here in Daniel chapter 6. I saw this quote uh, earlier this week, and I thought it was so practical. It says, church, we do not sing because we need a warm-up before the sermon. Church, we don't sing because people have time to get to their seats. Church, we should not sing because we need to be entertained. We sing because God is good. We sing because God is worthy. We sing because it is a communal act of unity which we declare the glory of God, the gravity of sin, and the grandeur of grace. See, songs are not not just something we tack on beforehand. See, when we come to worship with God, we worship in psalms, we worship in hymns, we worship in spiritual psalms, we worship in prayer, we worship in preaching, we worship when I go past 1130. We worship, right? We worship God. God is to be worshiped. God is great. God is good, and all the times he will be. So that's who God is. God is the creator of the universe. He's alive. He's eternal. He's self-existent, and that's what we find in the pages of Nahum. Secondly, about God, what is God's love? What is God's love? It, love is that deepest possible expression of God's character. Through God, he loves all people, and he is especially committed to the sacrificial, loyal relationships with his people. What does Nahum teach us about God's love? Well, the seventh verse of chapter one, as Andy was reading, it says, the Lord is good. He is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those and picture this with me. We have uh, Nineveh just uh, destroying the people of Judah, taking them into captivity. Uh, not very nice, being horrible, awful people. And you're uh, a child in Judah. Maybe you're a teenager. Maybe you're a young 20-something-year-old. And you find the book of Nahum. You find the letter. You find the scroll. And it's speaking that Nineveh is going to be chastise. It's like getting the newspaper and us getting like the newspaper like a few days early and maybe we're in war, maybe we're in conflict and we see the headline is God is good. We see in the headline that Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Could you imagine the praise, the adoration that this young person would do when they hear the words of Nahum and we find this as well even in today that the Lord, he is still good. He is still good. His very nature about him is good. His very nature is love. 1 John 4, 8, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God, says 1 John chapter 4. We find this picture in the book of Nahum that we, we find this scale, we find this balance. And we have on one side love. We have on one side these verses that the Lord is good. We find in the pages of Scripture that his very nature is love. But in that also is wrath. In that also is this perfect balance. Because of God's love, we know of his wrath. Because of his wrath, we know the, the deep affection in his love. God's very nature is love. God, as in throughout the scripture as a whole, often he gives different examples of his love. A couple of those is he is as a loving father. Deuteronomy 1 verse 31. In the wilderness where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. So Moses is reminding the people that God carried you like a child. And God is loving in his carrying. God is, is, is vengeful to those in, of his enemies, but he is loving and caring as a father. 
Proverbs 3, verse 12, for the Lord, the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. The, God is as a loving father. God is as a loving husband. Gives another picture. Jeremiah 31, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Hosea 2, and in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. Speaking of Israel worshiping other gods, no, God says, you're my husband. I am your husband. You are my bride. And the same in the New Testament, the church. You, you are the church, not this building. God is not concerned with uh, the, the building. He's concerned with you as the church. You are the church. We are the church. And God says, I love my church. And God is our husband as a church. God, he has a love for his people Love for his people Israel. Matthew 15, he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. God has a love for his church. John 16, 27, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. And God has a love for the world. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal, what is it? Life. God has given us life. And then the last point about God's love is that we know how to love because God is love. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. But I say to you, Jesus is saying in Matthew 5, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And all that, God says, you know how to love because I love you. Oftentimes, we're unlovable people. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but sometimes we mess up. If you haven't messed up, come talk to me and we'll discuss how you've messed up. And uh, we'll, we'll, I'll even tell you how much I've messed up. But we are just unlovable people at times. But God loved us. God still wants to save us. And in our relationships, as unloving as we are, God is saying to us, you need to love others. And we know how to love. We know how to love despite people's faults, despite how, how irritating we get to one another. We know how to love because we are that same irritation to God. And God says, I love you. I love you. And because of that, we know how to love. Thirdly and lastly, what is God's justice? <clears throat> what is God's justice? We find again this scale. We have wrath on one side, and well, what's on the other? If, if God is all wrath, then his scales are unbalanced, but again, we know that his scales are perfectly balanced. We know that he is always just. And Nahum teaches us about that. Nahum verse, chapter 1, verse 12, thus says the Lord, though they are at full strength and many, talking about Nineveh and the Assyrians, they will be cut down and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, God is saying and reminding Israel, yes, you've gone into uh, judgment. Yes, I've chastened you. Yes, I've disciplined you. They, I have afflicted you. I will afflict you no more. And now I will break his yoke from off you and will burst your bonds apart. So again, picture yourself being a young person in the land of Judah and you're reading through the scroll of Nahum and saying, okay, God, I, I remember you judging me. We're still in that judgment. And then God says, I will afflict you no more. What a, what a time of encouragement that is. And for us today, we can even draw some truths from this as well, that oftentimes when God continues to chasten us, God continues to, to discipline us, it's not forever. God does not desire to continue to discipline. God is driving us to repentance. And that is part of God's justice. When God's righteousness, when God's justice is spoken of in the Bible, it, incur, it occurs in the context of his rule. It occurs in, as him reigning as king. 
as Psalm 97 reminds us, cloud and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. God is always just. Acts verse seven, chapter 17 says, Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Jesus raising from the dead as, as that example for us. Uh, Genesis chapter 18, and I close with this verse. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put on the righteousness to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the do- earth do what is just? A question. And the answer is, of course he will do what is just. Because again, as God is full of wrath, God is also full of love. And they work together. And they are just. He is just. He is right. And the justice of God will always do what is right. So when God is chastening you and I, we shouldn't avoid it. We shouldn't um, lift our nose to God and say, God, I, I, don't, I don't care what, what, anything about you. I don't want any part of this. And I'm just going to leave. I'm going to not ever come back. No, we shouldn't do that. We should say, God, I turn to you. I repent of my sin. I desire to be in communication with you. And I want to live for you. The cl- song that we're going to close out is and can it be and the verse first verse goes like this that and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood the Savior's blood is what can cover your sins not just that but it can also blot out your sins have you ever had a stain in your shirt and you and you take the uh, whatever the detergent may be or whatever supplement you're adding and you're blotting out that stain you're completely removing it well that's what God can do with your sin for me who him to death pursued and that speaks of his amazing love how can it be we often question we offer wonder about God's love but God is loving but he is also of wrath so as we close out by singing and can it be think of those uh, way they work together God is just he will always do what is right so church we please stand we're close out by singing and can it be Father, you are good. You are just. You are righteous. Lord, you are full of mercy. You're eternal. You're also full of wrath. And Lord, we just pray that we'll see your love, but we will also see our sin. We ask, God, that you will uh, come before us, uh, prick the hearts of those uh, with this message, and help them understand that, yes, you're loving, but also You do not tolerate sin. Help us to repent. Help us to gain communion with you so that we may live for you and with you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the book of Nahum. I pray that it will be a blessing to many that hear. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God.
We will be eating after this. I'll pray for that. Um, it's over at the FBT Center. Um, and so we'll be heading right there after, after this. So let's pray. Father, we are thankful for this day. We know that, um, that you are a loving God. That doesn't mean you don't have wrath because you do. Because you hate sin. You hate things that are not from you. But you loved us so much that you died, that you bought us and redeemed us back out of that. That you have made us your own, and we thank you for that. We pray this morning um, for this food that you've, you've given to us. We thank you for um, the fellowship time that we'll have, the, the time that we can get together and enjoy a meal and just um, enjoy friendship and fellowship. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed week.